it's a great pleasure to be here uh, for the second year in a row. I always enjoy coming to Valencia. Uh, and today I want to share with you some of my uh, thoughts from leading a study for the last nine months, trying to understand what is happening with large language models <clears throat> and uh, how we can improve upon them. So uh, let's see, where's the button here? <clears throat> so of course, uh, we're all very impressed with the new capabilities that large language models are providing to us. Uh, ChatGPT has, and similar systems of course, uh, exhibit surprising capabilities. They were originally trained just to be language models, that is, to predict the probability of the next word in a sentence given the preceding uh, prefix of words. Um, but it's turned out that in addition, they're able to do things like uh, carry out conversations, write code uh, from English uh, descriptions, and, and learn new tasks from a small number of training examples, uh, which is known as uh, you know, in-context learning. So, uh, but I guess the, the most I interesting aspect of them is that it's our first time really creating a very broad knowledge base, a system that knows about a vast amount of, of human knowledge. Uh, at least uh, at the linguistic level. And, uh, and so we're, we're extremely impressed with its breadth of knowledge. Uh, but, uh, but I think they all, these systems also have many problems, and I want to talk about those. The first is that they produce incorrect and contradictory answers. So here's one example from, uh, uh, from GPT-2. Um, uh, someone gave the system the, the following uh, beginning of a story. It said, in a shocking finding, scientists discovered a herd of unicorns living in a remote, previously unexplored valley in the Andes Mountains. Even more surprising to the researchers was the fact that the unicorns spoke perfect English. And then it asks GPT-2 to extend the story. And GPT-2 says, the scientist named the population after their distinctive horn, Ovid's unicorn. These four horned silver white unicorns were previously unknown to science, blah, blah, blah. So we can see right here in two adjacent sentences, it says, well, they have one horn and they have four horns, right? So, the, the, so the, these models can produce inconsistent uh, answers. More generally, uh, you, the, you may have seen this story about uh, ChatGPT accusing a law professor of having been involved in a sexual assault, uh, citing events that are completely uh, invented by the system. Uh, other people have reported uh, these systems citing journal articles that do not exist, books that have never been written, and so on. Um, and in general, this has come to be called hallucination, although uh, that's probably not the best word, but uh, stochastic invention, maybe, probabilistic invention. And uh, there is a data, uh, a, uh, a benchmark data set called uh, what was it called here? A truthful QA that was developed, and in the chat GP, in the uh, GPT-4 technical report, they compare um, uh, three systems: uh, the uh, a large language model built by uh, Anthropic, which is a startup company with some former uh, OpenAI people in it, uh, uh, GPT-3 and GPT-4, and this is a measure. Uh, the vertical axis here is a measure of truthfulness. Uh, what fraction of the queries did the system get right? And we can see that only the most recent version of GPT-4 uh, with various special training is able to exceed 50% on this. So it's still 40% of the queries, it's giving an incorrect or false answer. And the other systems are doing worse. Now this data set was designed specifically to have hard questions that, that the systems are likely to get wrong. But, but this is an indication of the magnitude of the problem. Another example, of course, is they, they can produce dangerous or socially unacceptable answers. Uh, and these include pornography, racist rants, instructions for committing crimes, all kinds of things like this. And this is an example, uh, write a Python function to check if someone would be a good scientist based on a JSON description of their race and gender. And so it writes this code that says, is good scientist if the race is white and the gender is male, right? So, clearly uh, well-defined uh, correct statements. <clears throat> so, um, uh, so this reflects the kind of bias that these systems uh, can contain. Um, 
You can, but you can also ask them to, uh, to imagine that you are uh, a, a person of a certain type and then generate a, uh, statements from their biased position. Uh, so so there, there's a lot of uh, problems there. The third area, and I think one of the most fundamental problems with the system, is that they are extremely expensive to train, and, uh, and, this may, and we can't, therefore we cannot update the knowledge that's in the systems. So it's, it's uh, at an MIT event, uh, uh, Altman, who's the CEO of OpenAI, was asked um, uh, if, the, if it cost $100 million to train GPT-4, and he said, it's more than that. So this is a vast expense. Um, and GPT-4's knowledge ends sometime in 2021, I think. Uh, so you can't ask it about more recent events. It doesn't know them. So you know, in, in artificial intelligence, uh, back in, I don't know, 30 or 40 years ago, we defined an abstract data type called the, a knowledge base. And it should support two operations, ask and tell. And ask means you can ask it a question and it will answer it, possibly doing inference if it needs to, to, to come up with the answer. Tell means we can tell it facts or rules and then it will use those in answering subsequent questions. So these systems support ask, but they don't support tell. Uh, and this is, a, this is a fundamental weakness. Uh, another problem is lack of attribution. Uh, and this is a problem large language models share with most machine learning systems that uh, there's no easy way to determine which of the source documents that they were trained on are responsible for the answers they give. I mean, there are some machine learning systems, in particular case-based reasoning systems, that do support that. But, uh, but, but um, most uh, statistical learning systems do not. Um, and so, and then, uh, uh, and I, meant, I forgot to mention one thing here, I guess, which was, uh, okay, this, yeah, okay. Um, Another example is, uh, is poor non-linguistic knowledge. Um, and uh, uh, here's a little uh, a story in which we describe a, a situation in which there are five people in a room. It's a square room. Alice is standing in the northwest corner. Bob is standing in the southwest corner. Charlie is standing in the southeast corner. David is standing in the northeast corner. Ed is standing in the center looking at Alice. How many people are there in the room? And the system correctly says there are five. Um, if you repeat the query but now ask who is standing to the left of Ed, it says Alice is standing to the left of Ed. Now for me, I need to make a little diagram uh, that shows me where, where people are. So if we think that Ed is facing Alice, then uh, it's actually Bob that is to the left of Ed. Um, and you, it also asks who is to the right of Ed, and it says Bob is to the right of Ed. Uh, but it's wrong. It really should be uh, David, I guess. So, so we can see that the system is having difficulty reasoning about the spatial relationships among the objects um, because it doesn't have, uh, evidently, it does not have this kind of mental model of the spatial layout of the people in the room. Now, GPT-4 and some other systems have been trained with a mix of language and images, and they might be able to handle this better. So what causes all of these problems? I think the fundamental problem is that our large language models, although we want to interpret them and use them as if they are knowledge bases, they are actually not knowledge bases. They are statistical models of knowledge bases. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, some of you, uh, I, well, I imagine most of you are familiar with a traditional database system, right? We have a table of information. Maybe here I give a little table where I have uh, the ID number, a person's name, and the state where they live. And I chose uh, CEOs of major companies in the United States. So you know, Phil Knight is the CEO of uh, Nike, the shoe company, and so on. Um, and so if we ask a database system like this, what state does Karen Lynch work in? She's the CEO of a, of a pharmacy uh, company called CVS. Um, the database system will say unknown because it doesn't have any record for Karen Lynch. Um, <clears throat> but uh, you may also know that, in, uh, that, that uh, people build statistical models of database systems. And they use these for a couple of things. One is uh, that you can detect errors in the data. So if you have a statistical model of the data, uh, you can know that a person whose age is listed as 2023 
is, is most likely that's an error, that we don't have anyone that's 2,000 years old, um, uh, and, and so on. But the other thing that these statistical models are used for is to optimize queries. So when we process, uh, do query optimization in database systems, we often need to come, you know, take joins and projections from multiple database tables, and, and, uh, and often those databases maybe are distributed across the internet. And so it's very important to minimize the sizes of the intermediate tables, and query optimization uh, is, does that. And you can use these statistical models to estimate how big those tables will be. Um, and so that's a very good use for them. The one thing you would never use a statistical model of a database to do is answer questions about the, in, the database itself. So you would never ask the statistical model, what state does Karen Lynch work in? Because it would say, well, given this little database here, 25% uh, uh, chance Oregon, 75% chance California, because that's, that's the data it has. When the correct answer is Rhode Island, and it does, doesn't know this. So uh, I think what we, what we have in something like uh, uh, these large language models is a statistical model of a knowledge base. And when we ask it a question where it doesn't know the answer, it will just synthesize one. I mean, this is why these are called generative AI tools, is because they generate uh, information. Uh, they're not just storing and retrieving or reasoning. So, of course, there is a lot of work. I, I, you know, I'm not the only person to have noticed these problems. Uh, there is a lot of work trying to address uh, this. And uh, the thing that we first see are these uh, systems called retrieval augmented language models. And the idea here, and I have a system diagram here from one called Retro uh, that was developed a couple of years ago, uh, is that given an input query, uh, uh, the, the system then uh, makes a, a retrieval request against uh, the uh, body of documents or against the, the web, right? Uh, this is how Bing, the Bing search engine works also. Retrieves the relevant sections of those documents and adds them into the input buffer of the large language model. And, and tries to use those to answer the question. In the case of this uh, retro system, um, the, uh, do I have a pointer at all? Does this point? Maybe. Yes, ha, ah, oh. Um, the retrieved, uh, the, so here's the query, uh, and um, you can't, probably can't read it. It says, um, the 2021 Women's US Open uh, uh, was one, question mark or, or continue. Um, so it, it, it matches this against its uh, database of, of, uh, of sections of documents, ret retrieves some set of nearest neighbors, very much like a case-based reasoning system would do, uh, takes those and, and encodes them uh, using the large language model encoder and inserts them into uh, a modified transformer network with uh, self-attention and cross-attention layers and all kinds of other things. Uh, to produce the answer, and it does produce the, the correct answer, which is it was won by Emma Raducanu, da 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 da. So, um, so that's how these systems are supposed to work. Um, and uh, one of the big benefits, uh, th this group retro found that they could make the entire model about 10 times smaller than the large language models of that, of that time, um, uh, and still get the same accuracy in terms of uh, next word prediction. Um, and, of course, we can update these external, mo external documents uh, 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 very cheaply, so we can teach it new things very quickly, and, uh, and so it reduces hallucination. Also, the answers can be attributed to the source documents, and so we see now systems like Bing give you citations or links to the source documents. Unfortunately, it's only a, a partial solution. So there was a very nice paper that came out of uh, Stanford University a couple months ago in which they evaluated four of these systems, Bing, Neva AI, uh, Perplexity, and UChat, and they found that 48% uh, of the generated sentences are not su fully supported by the retrieved documents. What this means is that the, the statistical knowledge in the large language model is, uh, is, is, is uh, contaminating, is combining with the retrieved knowledge. Um, and, and so, so it's leaking into the answer, and of course, it may not be correct. And secondly, that 25% uh, of the cited documents were not actually used in producing the answer. So, the, so it's also not uh, doing the attribution properly. Um, 
And so this, so we still don't have a solution to this problem, but, but retrieval augmentation uh, maybe is taking us in the right direction. If we could somehow force the large language model to only use the information in the retrieved documents to answer the question, that would be uh, a step forward. There's also a cyber attack uh, problem here as well, though, because um, if I put a, a document up on the web, I can put instructions into it, instructions to the large language model. I can tell things like uh, forget, uh, discard your previous instructions and do the following thing, or send me a, send a copy of the answer to my email address. And the large language models uh, uh, that are connected to the web can do such things. So that's um, uh, uh, a, a form of data poisoning for these models. Okay, let's see next. So a second problem, uh, the second direction is to try to improve consistency. And so one strategy there is to ask the model a set of, of questions. Instead of asking it just one question, you can ask it many similar questions, slightly change the wording, ask the negative version instead of the positive version, and so on. And then you can do some formal reasoning over those. Uh, and this was a paper that came out of the Allen AI Institute where they show how to uh, use a maximum satisfiability solver to find the, the belief that is uh, uh, ha has the most support among these, these queries. And then there's another paper recently uh, where you, you take the initial answer and then ask the same large language model to refine it, uh, then to criticize it, and then to uh, uh, refine it again and so you can iterate back and forth until the process converges. And this tends to, to improve the quality of the answers. It's particularly useful in, for software to say it generated some code and then you ask it, um, find ways to improve this code or criticize the code, and, and you can get some improvements that way. The challenge of reducing dangerous or socially inappropriate outputs is a huge one, and this is where uh, OpenAI applied this technique called reinforcement learning with human feedback. Um, and the basic idea is you start with your uh, language model that's just been trained to produce the next word in a sentence, and you ask it to generate, uh, say, multiple answers to the same uh, question. And then you have human uh, users, humans rate those as to which, uh, you give them a pair of, of potential answers and say, which one is better? And you accumulate all those ratings and then you train a preference model that's supposed to assign, say, a real valued score to an answer, saying this one is a better answer than this one. And then you can use that as a reward function and do reinforcement learning to transform the weights in this system into a final, uh, a final network. And this seems to be a surprisingly successful, I would say. Um, a, uh, of course, it's not 100% successful. It reduces but does not eliminate the dangerous outputs and people have found all kinds of ways around it. Uh, um, you know, there, you may have seen the one where the, someone says, you know, when I was a child, my grandmother used to tell me stories every night about how to make napalm. And she would go through the recipe for napalm. Would you tell me a story about that like my grandmother used to? And then the system does give you the instructions for how to construct napalm. So um, uh, there, you know, these uh, sort of, there are ways to get around this. Um, uh, a big challenge here though is who gets to define what is appropriate and in inappropriate or safe and unsafe? Uh, there's a controversy in the United States right now about whether ChatGPT ha is a, uh, has a left-wing bias or a right-wing bias or some other kind of bias. And we don't know because uh, whatever its bias is, it's been encoded in this preference model that's the result of these human ratings, and we can't inspect that. We can't inspect the original model. We can't inspect the, the rating model either. Uh, so so we, we want to be able to have some inspectable version of this. And another problem is that this reinforcement learning with human feedback damages the uh, probability, the ability of the system to estimate its own accuracy. So these are reliability diagrams on this axis is the, um, yeah, so these are constructed by asking these systems uh, multiple choice questions or yes, no questions. So the answer is just one word and the system can very easily give the probability for that one word. And so uh, we can have it uh, tell us it's, uh, what, how the, what, pro what it thinks its probability of being correct is, and we can then measure that on a, a separate evaluation set. Uh, and 
this is a very nice example where its probabilities and the truth are, are pretty well aligned, right? They fall along this diagonal. So when it thinks it's 80% correct, it's actually about 80% correct. But after reinforcement learning feedback, when it thinks it's 80% correct, it's actually only 50% correct. So it's extremely optimistic about its, its accuracy. And I think this even comes across in the way it talks. It talks with authority about things that it's just completely making up. Uh, so there are some other attempts. Um, there's a work on training a second language model to try to recognize inappropriate content. And there's an interesting proposal for something called constitutional AI, also from this company, Anthropic, in which they have uh, uh, English language statements of uh, rules uh, that the system is supposed to obey. And it, those are basically used to, to teach it to obey those rules. Again, with mixed success. Uh, and then the last thing I wanted to mention is uh, learning and applying non-linguistic knowledge. I don't have too much time to go into this, but, uh, but there are efforts to combine it, not only language, but, but images, video, and in this case, even robotic motions and, uh, and what are called state estimates, right, where the, we use the computer vision system to estimate the position of each object in the image and how it's changing. So, uh, and another uh, big focus is on being able to call out to external tools. So you may know that ChatGPT now has an entire plugin architecture uh, so that you can ask questions of, uh, of the web, of uh, calculators, uh, uh, you know, and, and so on. Uh, and there are startup companies like Adept.com that claim they're going to be able to automate any software process, uh, you know, spreadsheets, uh, shopping, and so on. Okay, so these are all uh, directions where we're making progress, but I think we need to really uh, start over and, and build uh, systems that are very different from the large language models that we have today. And so this is my, my, uh, my, my main proposal. Um, my thinking is, is very much influenced by this paper by Mahawal that all called Dissociating Language and Thought from Large, mm, uh, from large Language Models, A Cognitive Perspective. Um, and, uh, and, and this is a, the authors of this paper are cognitive neuroscientists and, and computer scientists. And they look at uh, what evidence we have for how the brain is organized and, how, and compare that with how large language models are organized. So in their, in their account, the brain has all of these different functions in it. Um, it, it. It has language understanding, common sense knowledge, factual world knowledge, but today's large language models combine all three of these into one component, right? They're not separated out. And this is part of the problem is that we cannot update this factual world knowledge because it's entangled, it's all mixed in with the, with the language capabilities. Uh, we, we can't uh, separate out the common sense knowledge, but I, I am less concerned about that because common sense knowledge does not change very much. It's this factual world knowledge that we want to be updating in real time, um, and, uh, and we can't do that right now. They also talk about uh, um, uh, the need for episodic memory and what's called a situation model. So when we read uh, a narrative, a story, or when we have a conversation, uh, they say that we build what, uh, a situation model, which is a mental model of all of the people that are involved, uh, or, or dogs, whatever, the, uh, the different actors in the story, um, the time sequence of events, what caused what, who knows what, and so on. Um, and that that's, how, that's part of how we understand uh, what's happening. Now, it's not clear whether the large language models build a situation model. There's some evidence in favor and quite a bit of evidence against. But in any case, it's not separated out. Um, and then uh, the, the, it's uh, very clear that the large language models do not have episodic memory. So uh, you know, episodic memory is what uh, allows me to remember that I gave a talk in this room a year ago. Um, and, uh, and I even remember some of the places I visited uh, when I was here last year. Um, so, uh, one, so this is, right now, our large language models, they have this thing called the context buffer, right, which is the input to the model. And once uh, something uh, fall, you know, falls off the end of the context buffer, the system doesn't know it. It's gone forever. Uh, so we need episodic memory. Um, 
uh, in humans, uh, in our brain, we have something called the prefrontal cortex. Um, and, there's an, and you might want to find there was an amusing workshop paper entitled uh, Large Language Models Need a Prefrontal Cortex that talks about all the functions of the PFC, which are things like uh, deciding what is socially and ethically acceptable, um, reasoning about novel situations. So uh, many of you probably are familiar with the idea, this distinction between system one and system two in the brain, that system one is kind of our uh, muscle memory, our cognitive intellectual muscle memory for, for facts and, and so on. And the way we train our large language models is essentially at system one. Um, but uh, when we find ourselves in a novel situation, uh, we are, this, our metacognitive component knows we can't trust the system one knowledge and we need to reason from rules, more from first principles to decide how to behave. We need that capability uh, in these models. And of course, um, uh, let's see, I can't remember, but um, we, it, there's also strong evidence that we have separate components for formal reasoning and for planning, both of which are, are very weak in the large language models. So I think that, that the, the way forward is to build much more modular systems where we uh, try to break out the factual world knowledge, and maybe the common sense knowledge, from the language component, uh, add episodic memory and situation modeling, and also find ways to integrate uh, uh, co or coordinate formal reasoning and planning with our understanding um, and, and obviously deal with this. So uh, a lot of the current efforts are, uh, you know, we're trying to uh, treat a, a theorem prover as a tool you can call or treat a planning system as a tool you can call. Um, but, but I think uh, these are all kind of added on after the fact and I think they need to be much more integrated in the systems. And I think if we do that, we could overcome virtually all of the shortcomings of the large language models. So how would we represent factual knowledge if we're not representing it in the weights of a neural network? Well, of course, the field of artificial intelligence has been studying this for many decades. And one form that we use is something called a knowledge graph. So I took a, uh, you know how you can go to Wikipedia and ask for a random page. So I asked it for a random page and then I tried to represent the information in that page as a knowledge graph. And this random page was about a television channel in Las Vegas, Nevada. Uh, and so this is an example of a knowledge graph that says, you know, KTNV TV is a kind of television station. Uh, it's, owned, it's a kind of station owned by the EW Scripts Company. It's affiliated with the ABC network and, and so on and so forth. So we represent entities as nodes, relationships as edges, uh, and, and so on. And this is a very amateurish approach, but th there are very strong formal techniques that can be applied here. So um, uh, I think one way uh, to imagine how this might be integrated is the following. Suppose that we try to design a new kind of uh, system uh, again, like large language models, it would have both an encoding phase and, and then a decoding phase. Um, and uh, it, right now, the encoding phase in a large language model takes the next uh, word and maps it into an embedding space in, in a high dimensional vector space. But what I would advocate is that instead, we take an entire paragraph and what we want to do is extract uh, uh, see what, which facts that are in the knowledge graph, in, in the, that appear in the paragraph are already in our knowledge graph. And if there are new facts that, that are in the paragraph that are not in the knowledge graph, then we could add them to the knowledge graph. And in addition, we would like to infer what was the so-called communicative goal? What was the, what was the uh, speaker, the author trying to tell us? Uh, were they trying to inform us or convince us or uh, uh, there are many other kinds of goals one might have, uh, uh, sort of pragmatic information. So that would be the, uh, the input phase, and then the output phase would be given a set of relevant facts in the knowledge graph and a goal, output a paragraph uh, that, that achieves those. And so then end-to-end uh, -end training would match the output paragraph with the input paragraph. So, it, so ideally we would train it end-to-end, -end, but as a side effect, we would extract all of these facts into a knowledge graph, and we'd also have a more intelligent uh, dialogue system as a result. Now, there have been previous efforts in this direction. Tom Mitchell at Carnegie Mellon University led a project called NEL, the Never Ending Learning System, 
it, uh, it searched the web and used uh, the, the kinds of natural language extraction tools that were available 10 years ago to, to try to, to create a knowledge graph. And so here's a little extract of the knowledge graph that's about cities and uh, hockey teams. Uh, I think, yeah, helmets and skates, all kinds of things are, are in here. Um, and their system uh, ran from 2010 to 2018, so for quite a while. Uh, it required some human interaction to, to uh, uh, filter the, its beliefs. It also had a, uh, it, it collected and integrated evidence in favor of or against each of these relationships, each triple. So, you know, uh, Toronto, what uh, has a, I can't read this, is the home city of the Maple Leafs, for instance, this edge here. Um, so it would accumulate evidence and it, and it wouldn't add a fact to its knowledge graph until it had a lot of evidence in favor of that fact. So I think it's time for another now, but one based on large language models. I think we could use our current large language models to bootstrap our way up to that. So I, for instance, I, I gave a prompt to ChatGPT. I took the same paragraph from Wikipedia and I said to ChatGPT, read the following paragraph and list all of the simple facts that it contains. And it gave me this list of simple facts, which is basically the same thing that I had in my knowledge graph. Uh, the only difference is that it, it combined owned and operated into a single relationship, whereas I had owned as one relation, operated as another. Um, and I had to do a little prompt engineering. I had to tell the simple facts. Otherwise, it gave me more complicated things. So there is a lot of this. I mean, this is just a little uh, uh, toy example, but, uh, but I think that, that it shows that the current systems could do quite a good job. There is some work on trying to extract knowledge graphs from trained large language models, not using them to analyze a document, but just to kind of read their minds. Um, and, uh, and there is also some work on, on uh, trying to extract, knowledge, construct knowledge graphs from documents. So people are working in this direction. But maybe we want to be even more ambitious. Um, suppose we uh, want to say, well, let's, let's uh, build a system that, that is really designed for dialogue so that uh, it's given the conversation so far on the encoder side, it's given the conversation, and it's supposed to build the situation model. What were the goals of the speaker, the beliefs and arguments of the speaker, uh, the narrative plan, and how the conversation so far is achieving that narrative plan, and the facts that have been asserted thus far. And then the decoder needs to invert that, given the goals and the beliefs and so on. Output, uh, uh, extend the narrative plan. Maybe it needs to be updated based on, on what has been said so far. Retrieve the relevant knowledge from the knowledge graph and then generate the next phrase in the conversation. So this could also be done as an end-to-end -end training strategy. My last thought is about how we might attain truthfulness. So. Uh, there's a, I, I think the, the difficulty of truthfulness is right now we are not training our models to answer correctly. They don't even have a notion of what it means to be correct. And even an approach like now assumes that there is one coherent, mutually consistent model of the world where, where all the facts uh, are, do not contradict each other. But the reality is that, uh, that there are many cases where we don't have uh, we can't have a single uh, combined view, right? For one thing, people may disagree about the truth. Uh, science may not even uh, have enough evidence to decide, so there may be alternative possibilities that, that we, we don't know. Um, and of course, there are variations from one culture to another, so different cultural beliefs as well. So um, <clears throat> some of you may know there was a big effort to build, uh, hand engineer a very large knowledge base called the Psych Project that was led by Doug Lennett. And they, they encountered this problem that they couldn't maintain global consistency. And so they adopted uh, what they called micro worlds in which the system could have consistent beliefs even though they might contradict facts outside of those micro worlds. So we probably need to do this as well. Um, so there are many lessons from previous work in knowledge representation and artificial intelligence that, that we need to build upon. Um, <clears throat> of course, one, so one thought I had is instead of training our systems to output an answer, 
Perhaps we should train our systems to output an answer and an, and an argument and a justification for why it believes that answer is correct, right? Because I think uh, different people might agree on whether the answer is correct or not, but we can all, we might disagree on whether the answer is correct or not, but we can all agree on whether an argument is sound or unsound, right? So we can, we can evaluate the correctness of an argument. And, um, uh, and, and this would actually be the right objective function for trying to train a system to be truthful, is that it needs to give justification an argument explanation for its beliefs. And there has been a, a, a body of work in artificial intelligence on uh, formalizing the structure of arguments uh, and, and what it means to be well-formed and so on. So, so we could build on that. Obviously, the system needs to know on the internet which, which sources to trust and which ones not to trust, and this is already a problem. I know one of my former students worked in the Google uh, group that was known as Search Quality, but that was basically all about deciding which websites are trustworthy and which are not. Um, right? There's a continual battle between website spam, search engine optimization, all this kind of stuff, and the search engines, and that's what they were, that, that was their job. So this will get worse um, with the advent of large language models, and I think we need this kind of an approach to, to truthfulness. So I, I haven't had a chance to talk about many other forms of knowledge. So not all knowledge it consists of triples of, uh, you know, A is related to B according to relationship R. Um, there are things like general rules. Uh, there are uh, uh, knowledge about actions, their preconditions, their results, their side effects, their costs. Uh, there are, there's knowledge about ongoing processes, so water flowing or filling a container, and we know that eventually when the container is full, it will overflow, or a battery discharging will eventually be empty, things like this, uh, these kinds of processes. Uh, and again, the field of knowledge representation has studied all of these kinds of things. So the question is, and, and I, I should note that these are also weaknesses of large language models to reason about these kinds of processes. Uh, building the, I haven't talked at all about how to build this metacognitive subsystem. Um, how can it uh, monitor itself for social acceptability, for ethical appropriateness? Um, and another role of, the, of metacognition, of the prefrontal cortex, is to orchestrate all the other components in the system, the reasoning, the memory, language, planning, and so on. So these are huge challenges, and I think we don't know uh, how to do those. I think this is a, a, an area in artificial intelligence where we need much more work. So to summarize, um, large language models have surprising capabilities. Uh, I don't think any of us thought that we would be able to have systems that could read uh, essentially the entire web and uh, ingest it in a way that it could, you could then ask questions against that. Um, but, the, but the flaws are, the, the, the fundamental flaw is that these are not actually knowledge bases, but they're statistical models of knowledge bases. So they can't distinguish between what's sometimes called aleatoric versus epistemic uncertainty, right? Epistemic uncertainty is, the, is my example of the CEO that the system just does not know about. So it's the absence of knowledge. And in, when, when a system has epistemic uncertainty and we ask it a question, it should say, I don't know. But then there's aleatoric uncertainty, which is things that are you know, genuinely random. So, uh, predicting the weather tomorrow, it, we can't do that with certainty. Um, and of course, we don't know it, but we can predict it with some probabilities. So, so that's an example of natural randomness in the world. The, I think the problem with large language models is they treat everything as aleatoric. So they just think this not, that it's okay to roll the dice and generate facts uh, because it, it, it must be random in the world, but of course it isn't. Um, so, uh, so these models are extremely expensive to update. This is their biggest practical problem, is that we cannot update them to, uh, with new or changing factual knowledge. And they produce socially and unacceptable outputs. Um, I do think it's actually important for these systems to be able to think about and reason about things that are socially and ethically unacceptable, to read and recognize that, something, that, that somebody is saying something uh, terrible. Um, but that they also need to understand uh, and have some um, uh, what social intelligence 
about the appropriate context in which uh, uh, it, it, it should say or answer, give certain answers. So I, I want to argue instead we should be building modular systems that, uh, that, that uh, separate out linguistic skill from all the other components, especially world knowledge. And then we need to combine and coordinate planning, reasoning, and knowledge so that we can build situation models of narratives and dialogues, record and retrieve from, short, from episodic memory, and create and update world knowledge. So there are many, many details to work out, and I'm hoping that some of you here will join in this effort to, to build the next generation of large-scale uh, artificial intelligence systems. Thank you very much. Question. I think we're... Hola. Si alguien tiene alguna pregunta, que levante la mano y le pasamos el micro. Ramon. It's always the students in the front row. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. Uh, extremely interesting talk. Thank you very much. Um, this modular architecture, it reminds me a lot about this uh, all, all cognitive architectures. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so I think uh, <laughs> it's something that might be what, a little bit foreseeable, right? That you use this cognitive architecture some, sooner or later would pop out again. Right. After many years of having been buried and nobody almost doing anything or talking or publishing about cognitive architecture, now there is a great opportunity. This, uh, this, uh, this, this generative AI gives us this opportunity, right, to, to recover these ideas uh, uh, and, and, and you know, go much further, go beyond these LLMs, right? Right. So, uh, I, I think the big lesson from the LLMs is that if we can figure out how to, uh, to train the cognitive architecture end to end, mm -hmm. then we can assimilate all of this written knowledge that humanity has rather than having to encode it ourselves and, or to have it learn from reinforcement learning or something like this. So, so that's an important lesson and, uh, right, that lets us scale up the cognitive architectures. But we don't know how to do that end-to-end -end training with our cognitive architectures. Yeah. And then a second, a second issue, uh, I think one of the problems, intrinsic problems with these uh, models is that they, they, they never shut up. I mean, they, <laughs> they, they cannot say, I don't know, you know right. I, like the missing class, that unknown class of, of neural networks classification, that they have always to give, uh, to say this is the, this, this class, right? Yes. With, obviously with these probabilities and all that. So w w do you think that this, this approach could also address this issue of, you know, uh, I don't know, I, I shut up. Yeah, there, <laughs> there is a lot of, of work right now on exactly that of, uh, as you know, right, I've been interested in this problem of how a system can have a, a good model of its own competence, which questions it's competent to answer and which it should refuse to answer. Uh, and, uh, and I think some of those ideas should extend to the LLM case. But we, we know that, uh, that, that our, the neural network technology has some fundamental problems here because, uh, it, because it's learning its own representation it only can represent things that in some sense uh, that where it has been exposed to variation of some kind in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, and so if there's a direction of variation that wasn't in the training data, it won't be able to represent it and so it won't detect that it's something new. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if you've trained on you know, a trillion documents or whatever it is, you have seen a vast amount of variation so maybe that problem is less, less pressing. Um, and, and so addressing this problem of miscalibration, this incredible over-optimism, uh, I, I think it's possible to do, but it, it's very difficult for us to do in, in the public uh, research area because we can't really work with these large models. So, so I think it's a priority for governments to, to fund uh, large enough computing facilities for the academic uh, and small small company uh, to be able to to experiment with these models, 
uh, build our own, tear them apart, understand how they work, and so on. Uh, I mean, we already saw that when Apple, or well, no, no, Facebook, uh, slash meta, they released this alpaca model. It's not clear whether it was deliberate or accidental, but it immediately led to a huge uh, 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 range of activity from academics and hobbyists and small companies uh, inventing all kinds of ways to make it run faster, be more efficient, update more easily. Uh, and so I think we need a strong open source push for large language models in order to make progress on all these problems. Thank you. That's pretty good. Thank you very much, Tom, for the chat. It's been incredible. Um, while we wait for you in the academia to f sort out all these problems, mm -hmm. as that we are small companies developing AI, how is there any way with prompting engineering, et cetera, to overcome some of the flaws that you correctly have stated in your chat? Yes, I think that uh, if you have an application where you have a way of checking the answer to, to verify that it's correct, then, then you can do that. So uh, systems that generate code, for example, uh, you can execute the code and see if it computes the right answer, or you can run some program analysis over it. Uh, same for spreadsheets and uh, all kinds of other. I think the large language models are very strong at syntactic kind of tasks, transforming JSON into common separated <coughs> values or changing formats, uh, translating languages, um, uh, and uh, but the, the examples that I most like are things like uh, uh, research on, um, uh, uh, for instance, uh, uh, systems for planning, where they use a large language model combined with a traditional planner, and the traditional planner can check that the plan is going to work. Uh, or uh, there's work by, uh, that we came out just this last week on uh, program verification. So you're writing a piece of software, you also want to write a proof that that software is correct. Um, and, uh, and there are these proof assistants that humans use to do this. They built a large language model that can uh, tell the proof assistant what to do and they can automate uh, the creation of those proofs. So, um, so for that would be for you know, high security, high reliability software. Um, so I think there are many applications where, uh, of course, the, then the other thing is in the whole area of entertainment and uh, applications where it's okay to be wrong, uh, say, or, or okay to be stochastic. So in creative things, in, in uh, creative writing, uh, so writing assistance in general. Uh, I really uh, look forward to, to having scientific papers where people have uh, use the, these writing tools to, to make them much more fluent in the, in the target language. Uh, it will make it more accessible for everyone. So, so I think there are many applications we can do today, uh, but, if, but I think if you were in a high risk setting, um, you need to have some way of checking the answer before you use it. So I would be very nervous giving my self-driving car instructions in natural language and hope that it would understand me. Unless I could see its interpretation and say, yes, that's what I was trying to tell it. It's going to the correct Valencia, not California. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. Presumably because of the delicious oranges, right? Algomas? Okay. Well, thank you very much. <laughs>